I'm Philip Siegel of Havana Phil Cigar Company. And I'm Shayna Lee, the social media manager here and owner of Shayna Lee Photography. Welcome to Behind the Smoke Screen, where we give you a raw and unfiltered look at what it's like to run a business as two young entrepreneurs. In our line of work, we have the pleasure of creating relationships with a variety of characters. Influencers, athletes, models, digital media gurus, CEOs, and industry experts. And we'll be inviting them on to share with you. Sit back, grab a sip and a smoke as we take you behind the smoke screen. Welcome everybody to Behind the Smoke Screens. This episode <laughs> is presented by Cooper's Craft Bourbon. Mm. We have a featured cocktail for the day, for the episode. It's a Maduro Manhattan, made by Shelby, our amazing bartender. Hey! Shelby. Very delicious, dark, luscious, and rich. <laughs> the drink? Yeah. <laughs> the drink of Shelby. Drink. Yeah, yeah. And Shelby. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. We're off to a great start here. And we are joined today by West Knight. Ooh, sounds good coming out of your velvet voice, man. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. I appreciate that. I love the hat, by the way. Chance. Represent. Big Chance fan. Huge Chance, Chance the rapper? fan. Yep. I saw him in concert. Mm, how couple, good was he? It was so good. Yep. A couple years back. You know, he was the first independent artist to ever sell out a football Stadium, an, really? an arena. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he's the first artist to win a Grammy without a record deal. Yep. He's so good. Yeah. And his parents are politicians in Chicago. Cool yeah. family. Cool family. Yeah, yeah, let's not take the spotlight away from you. <laughs> I'm good at deflecting, man. I, <laughs> I, I see that you noticed that. So, Wes, you have an interesting story. Um, former yeah. soccer player, professional soccer player. Yep. Um, Long time ago. Entrepreneur. Yep. And, I mean, that's pretty cool. You, you played up in Vancouver, right? I did. That's where I started my career. Uh, from a little town in South Carolina called Easley. Uh, if you now know Clemson, you were very close to Clemson. And Clemson fans still get on my nerves. But <laughs> shout out to how Me good too. they are now. Yeah. They are... They are uh, deserving of their brash arrogance now. Mm -hmm. Before they were not, but they are now. Yeah, 2009, took a flight from Char uh, Charleston, South Carolina to Vancouver, British Columbia, and my life changed, man. Like, How long was that flight? <clears throat> man, it was three flights. It Ooh. was, you know, your boy hadn't been, I hadn't been on a flight longer than four hours in my life, and I was on four hours up to Minnesota, then four hours down to Dallas, and another three hours up to Vancouver. And so that trip alone was like a 12-hour venture wow. to get to a different country and to be escorted into an apartment that was now going to be my life wow. and change my life forever, man. It was the coolest uh, 24 to 48 hours that I had ever, like, imagined it to be it, it 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 was it was more than any kid could could dream it to be it was no nfl draft mm -hmm. it was no rags to immediate riches story mm -hmm. it was just i got out yeah you mm -hmm. know i got out mm -hmm. and uh i had an i had an opportunity yeah. so yeah i was 09 and that's where kind of like life as an adult began mm -hmm. i was 21 yeah. at that time what was that feeling when you stepped off the plane yeah, <laughs> cold, man. Yeah, cold. And it's funny because back in the day, I mean, this was 2009, and you know, baggy clothes were still kind of cool in the southeast. Mm -hmm. You know, this was Hurley time, <laughs> surfer stuff, right? Like Billabong. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that was kind of the vibe I was yeah. on. And I step in Canada, and it's very, it's a part of the British Commonwealth, so it's very European. Mm -hmm. You got guys wearing super skinny jeans, and mm -hmm. you know, are mediums but wearing smalls Schmediums. it's schmediums <laughs> and uh and it was from fashion to language to choices in food it was just a complete 180 from easily south carolina and it was awesome mm -hmm. yeah uh it was awesome that was right around the olympics right it was man uh mm -hmm. olympics was 2010 
Oh, okay. So I got there in January, into January 2009. So I had an entire year to get accustomed to like Canadian life, learn about the loonie, which is the Canadian dollar. Loonie and toonie. The toonie is the two dollar in Canadians, which, you know. How do you know off? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, not very useful in the strip club. A, right. a, a loonie is, but a toonie is not. Yeah. Toonie's what you tip with. The loonie's what you, right. what you, what you other tip with. Mm-hmm. They're coins, right? <laughs> Correct. Oh. Yeah. Correct. So that was <laughs> unique. <laughs> Learning. Have you been there? I've been to Toronto. Okay. Yeah. But not Vancouver. I really, really want to go. I heard Top five city every year in the, in the earth, on earth. Yeah. Top five city. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, you could be in, in uh, April or May. You could be skiing in the morning and golfing in, in the afternoon. Wow. I mean, it's just, it's just that accessible to you. It's, it's unbelievable how many things are available. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Cool spot. So you were there... How many years? Man, so Vancouver Whitecaps uh, is the team there. Mm-hmm. Um, I was there from 2009 until my last year was t- 2012. Mm-hmm. And then I had a girlfriend at the time there that kept bringing me back. My, my next team was, was down in San Antonio. Okay. And then I'd come back in the off seasons back to Vancouver. We had a place mm-hmm. and a growing relationship. Nice. And then after that season, I went to Edmonton, which is in Alberta. The home, you know, the place that the king built, the goat built, mm-hmm. uh, Wayne Gretzky. Mm-hmm. So I was uh, in Edmonton for a year, and then we'd go back in the off season. So I was there, uh, 09 to 2015. Wow, back and forth. But I played for the Caps uh, okay. until 12. Nice. That was the beginning. How was San Antonio? Coming from Vancouver, there was nothing to do. Yeah. Dry. Uh, what's that? Pretty dry. Place. Dry. Yeah. Uh, great food. Great, like, uh, you know, Hispanic food. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mexican American food was unbelievable. But yeah, it was. It was. Um, it was not as eventful. Not much going on in the city. Hot, dry. Uh, not a lot to talk about. I skip over those years <laughs> in uh, in San Antonio and Edmonton pretty quickly because yeah. they were. San Antonio was terribly hot and Edmonton was terribly cold. But you would play down there and then you would travel back in the yeah. offseason. Yeah, back, to, back yeah. in the offseason. Yeah. That's a good life. It was cool, man. Yeah. It, there was a lot of, of good times. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of memories, man. I know you're a big fun, uh, fan of, Jay, of, of Biz Nasty and one of our mm-hmm. captains yeah. in, uh, in Vancouver was great friends with Biz Nasty. Awesome. And yeah. so He's the man. Partying with that guy mm-hmm. is like... It's a spectacle, man. He's as good at partying as, like, he is to party as David Beckham is to soccer. Right. Or LeBron James is to basketball. Right. That guy understands the intricacies of a good time. Mm. Right. And where he is in the party, you want to be. Yeah, and that's kind of how he built his career, Correct. And he understood that about himself. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about, like, what I wanted to... Let's do a backstory for Shana. Yeah. Biz Nasty is a... (laughs) He's a famous uh, influencer and um, hockey like celebrity, mm-hmm. but he was never really good at hockey. He was just a fighter, mm-hmm. but he kind of made his name by um, fighting, uh, gooning, and also you know getting like sponsorships, promotions, and because he was really good at mm-hmm. tweeting, his Twitter feed was lit. Back mm-hmm. in the day when social media wasn't really cool to be controversial on social. Mm-hmm. It was like Twitter was this new thing. Instagram didn't exist yet. Uh, Facebook didn't really allow you or it wanted you to do more pictures and video. Yeah. It didn't just yeah. allow for 160 characters or whatever it was back in the day. Biz Nasty was the guy that would say the thing that shouldn't be said mm-hmm. on Twitter. <laughs> and it garnered all the attention. And so... The people that love Bleacher Report these days loved Biz Nasty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, does that does that make sense? To yeah, you? that makes sense. Yeah, because most Barstool. people are trying to like sugarcoat everything. Correct. So for someone to come in and Raw. actually say what they mean in and your like, face, not care, is and non-apologetic. Yeah. Plus, he was an a partier, sure. and he knew how to party. Yeah. So that's most likely how he built all his connections. And you know, it's, it reminds me of Dennis Rodman. Is yes. That not a good example. Yeah. Is that, yes. Yeah. Okay. Not quite. Not even close to the level of like, like daring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
a little sense. closer to like uh, McGregor. Yeah, closer to McGregor than, he says than what he Cam. Wants. Yeah, yeah, a little closer to McGregor. Um, I was just thinking like fashion. I like it. Like, I like it. The fashion. Biz and biz and so fashion. That he's not as artistic. Yeah. You know he's more. <laughs> he's, gr- he's grunge. He's grunge, man. Yeah. 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 So people like that, they migrate to Vancouver. They don't go to San Antonio. Is what I meant. Right. That was yeah. exactly. That was what I meant. Yeah. So bring it back to the MLS. What was what was like the scene like for you guys were you kind of well known when you went out or was it more of like you guys just went out as a team and and just had a good time and i think in our own minds we were well known Mm -hmm. but i think no one knew who we were man um and what was exciting is that i was a part of the cusp of the mls really starting to come of age we had this superstar enter our realm in our atmosphere named David Beckham. Mm. And, you know, I tell this story all the time. There's only two people I've seen in my life who can bend reality, who can literally force people to act differently than they've ever acted because they are around them. It's like this magnetic Mm. force that someone that is a superstar has. And that's David Beckham and LeBron James. Is that why they say bend it like Beckham? (laughs) <laughs> yeah 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 i mean that guy was so powerful yeah that guy was so powerful i mean the entire stadiums you could feel or like watching him whatever he did mm-hmm. uh wherever he went you know as in, we used to make fun of the situation that it also he doesn't would, hurt he's really sexy right <laughs> He, he's not a bad looking guy. Okay. Not a, I'm not ashamed to admit, not a bad to, looking guy. I have to Total speak man for the rocket. women here There's and say. Been a lot of times I went to a barber and said, I'll take the David Beckham. <laughs> yeah. I'm not ashamed to admit that. Mm-hmm. But being around him and just knowing how much pressure is on, on him and how many eyes are on him, if you were at that space, you'd want to have it and wear it like he wears it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like this guy used to have to leave his garage in the morning, two black Denali's leaving at the same time and going different directions out of his driveway because with all of the, uh, all of the camera and paparazzi, they, they couldn't know which wow. vehicle he was in. Is that because mm-hmm. of him or because of who he's married to? I think it started because of who he was married to. Yeah. And was I think they to? together were able to like take a meta leap in stardom, Posh Spice. Spice Girls. See, I know my information. Yeah. Victoria. I don't even know that. <laughs> yeah. If I showed you a picture of her, yeah. you might be like, ah, oh, Spice Girls. You would know. Maybe. I've heard you of the Spice her. Girls. She's like, yeah. sure. like But she's David posh. Beckham is way more popular than the Spice Girls. I don't know. She created the, the pop culture idol that he is, though. She created You only the say that really? because you were born in the Just 90s. Google, like, for your listeners... <laughs> For your listeners that care or might be bored while listening to this, Mm -hmm. uh, just Google David Beckham before celebrity. You'll Mm -hmm. see no color in his hair, teeth, needed braces, acne. So she transformed it. Yeah, she brought her whole uh, pop culture team and fashion-oriented minds around him Mm -hmm. and uh, guided, guided young Bex. Yeah. Yeah, he was a young guy when they met. And, I mean... Same thing with Cristiano Ronaldo, if you know that name. Look at I what he looked name. like before celebrity. <laughs> yeah, he's you know? a man. And Messi, same. Messi or Ronaldo? Me? Yeah. Ronaldo. Messi. What? Messi. Ask any real footballer, mm-hmm. they're a Messi fan. Because of the technique? It's, man, it's Datsuk. Yeah. It's like if you're a hockey player and you watch Datsuk play, mm-hmm. and for you, for you individuals that might not know uh, Pablo Datsuk, if, if you're a basketball fan, it's, it's uh, Jason Williams mm-hmm. or Steve Nash right? Um, or Steph Curry. LeBron versus Curry, yeah. It, it's LeBron mm-hmm. versus Curry, yeah. right? So it's, it's really what you appreciate about the game that they play. For me, Leo is, is, is the god. Yeah. He can do things that I've never seen anyone even get close to doing. Yeah. Um, although Cristiano can too. Yeah. I just have an appreciation for the like the technique. For me it's it's LeBron and Ronaldo. Yeah. I can see that out of you though. Because it's like superhuman. Sure. Like, these guys are so powerful, so fast. Like 
you'll never see anything like that. But like Messi just looks like this normal guy. Steph Curry. Just That's looks why like I this think it's incredible guy. because like I don't identify with six foot eight, incredibly powerful human that has this natural gift and was guided because they had the natural gift. What I love and identify with is a dude from Easley or the individual who's just like the next guy, the guy next door who had a chip on his shoulder and just decided, I bet you at some point Messi had somebody tell him that he was too small and he wasn't good enough and he couldn't make the team and that was everything he needed to hear. Okay. I, I don't, I've never heard any podcast from story, uh, mm-hmm. from Messi's story, but I would guarantee that there's some person that he can relate it to. I listened to a great podcast the other day it was Steve Harvey. Okay. Mm-hmm. Love Steve mm-hmm. Harvey. Anybody Big cigar that, guy. What? Yeah. Incredible mm. human period, but like loves all the intricacies of life. Mm-hmm. It works hard. Right. So I, I, last year I spent the entire year oh. managing this guy. His name's Charlie Rocket. He goes by at Charlie on Instagram, managing his entire speaking Shout career. Out. And uh, when we were managing his speaking career, he was very heavily being pursued by. Uh, this guy named Tabidi, and we were like, "Who's this guy named Tabidi? He keeps give us, giving us a call, shooting us with texts." Turns out it was Steve uh, Harvey's manager mm. who wanted him to come on and, and be a part of of one of the shows Steve runs. Steve has four different shows, so we took a meeting with Tabidi, and Tabidi told us this story uh, about Steve Harvey, which I also confirmed and heard on the podcast. So Steve Harvey, when he was younger, had a stutter. Steve, you watch him today, it's incredible to watch mm-hmm. how, how natural speech is and how he mm-hmm. can connect with the audience and it's effortless. Mm-hmm. He's gained mastery, right? But when he was a kid, he had a stuttering issue. And he talks about this time when he was in elementary school where the teacher asked him to stand up and give a presentation about what he wanted to be when he grew up. And his presentation, as he stood up and stuttered through it, was hilarious to not only the, the entire class, but to the teacher. I see where this is going. It was hilarious to the entire class because he was stuttering. Mm. It was hilarious to the teacher because the kid that was stuttering was saying to the teacher or to the class, he wanted to be on TV one day. Right. So Steve Harvey talks about the first day, and he, and he goes to this whole depiction about how he failed to get from comedy you know, club to comedy club, was going broken and mm-hmm. was about to get kicked out of his family. Uh, his wife was gonna kick him to the curb because he was, you know, quit his job to be a comedian and was mm-hmm. really putting everything out there to make it happen. And the first day that he got on television, he, uh, he decided that every Christmas he was gonna send that teacher the newest and greatest television <laughs> and she was going to be sure that she could see him on TV. Yeah. So what wow. I love to see is the individual that had that moment happen to them mm-hmm. and like completely changed their life. Mm-hmm. Um, that to me is really inspiring because that is like all around us. And it's only, the only reason, the only way that happens is if they make it to a place where their story has to be told or you go find it. Did you have that happen to you? Man, yeah, when I was little, I had, a, I had uh, yeah, I had all of, it felt like all of Easley laugh because I was a soccer player in a world where everybody was a baseball or football or basketball player. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was this little kid that, man, I remember outside uh, our, our, our high school <clears throat> was actually a very small playing field where the marching band used to, used to play. That was like their marching quarters they kind of got positioned out in this little bitty sliver of a pizza slice of, of a yard mm-hmm. where they could practice. And when the marching band was finished, I was there with my little ball and I used to take shoes cause I couldn't afford cones and my parents wouldn't pay for them for me. So I would take sh- old shoes and sandals and they'd use those as cones. Wow. And I'd like just work, yeah. you know, like I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew that that was something. It was just your passion. Right. Yeah. Like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I knew that there were other people doing something and I didn't know what they did. I just wanted to be able to say I was doing something. But was yeah. there a point at where you, you knew that you were really good, that you just knew? And also, Man. did you, and was there a point where you knew this is what you wanted to do with your life? Yeah, it didn't hit me till college. Yeah, when I, um, 
I, I think the next sort of slap on my wrist or slap in my face, I'll call it, is when I was uh, a senior trying to get recruited to college mm -hmm. and no one would offer me a scholarship. So I was actually a recruited walk on to the College of Charleston. Nice. And uh, got no money, barely made it in scholastically. I made, you know, took the SAT like two to three times and made a 1050 total cumulative. Um, school wasn't my thing. And so I, I, you know, I barely made it in academically. I barely made it in athletically. And I remember our first training session with uh, grown ass men. This was the first time that like, I was playing, I'm 17 and there was 23 year old men out there. Mm -hmm. And at that point, when I started to have success, I knew if I can do this here, <clears throat> and these guys are getting opportunities at the pros, then, uh, you know, all breaks are off. Mm -hmm. Like, let's what go. Was, what was the life like at Charleston? Man. It's what we it, didn't it, know how good we had it. It's seventy percent girls, right? If not more. Who yeah. Hell, like just knows the statistics. If not more. My if, my cousin went more. to call, college of Charles. <laughs> if not more. Phil doesn't research his guests. He just like researches <laughs> the girls, the percentage of women in different cities. Exactly. <laughs> there are more bars per. Uh, <laughs> per capita in Charleston mm. than any other city in the United States. Yeah. You can I mean, throw up rock and hit a bar. The nightlife there is insane. Yeah. The food is incredible. And it's all built on mm -hmm. tourism, right? Mm -hmm. So people it's, it's are constantly thing. coming in and there's new people in bars and as long as you just rotate your scene, you're never going to be flagged. Mm -hmm. So we didn't realize how much fun it was until we left. Right. I mean, look, here was a scenario. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me play it out for you. There was no football, okay? So we weren't fighting with superstars, basically, from NCAA football. Mm -hmm. We were instantly up at the level of basketball, baseball, and then there were soccer players that actually mattered at this school. Where in a lot of schools, especially big SEC and ACC schools, they don't really, they don't really matter. And you were only 30%, but you were like the top 1% of the 30%. Right. There was, a, there was, there was, you know, it, we, our, our competition were the fraternities. Right. Which ended up being a, a, a unique battle. But, uh, did you guys fight? Yeah, man. It was, it, there were, there were so many weird, uh, issues between interesting dynamics. Like us and the baseball team never got along. Hmm. That was weird. Mm -hmm. Us in the Sigma Chi fraternity for some reason, just like that. Mm -hmm. Fraternity, I have no idea why they didn't. But it was like when you came into the soccer team, you didn't like that fraternity and you didn't like that sport. Right. And it was just a part of the culture. And I, yeah. I didn't ask questions because I was a little kid and a 23-year-old man was telling me not to like that. So it's like, okay, we're not doing that. Yeah. Um, but when I look back at it in retrospect, it was all in competition of the girls. Yeah, and I was going to say, was it, it absolutely has something to do with who. It all routes what, back. Like who goes with to, who. To temptation. Yeah. Right. It all right. routes back to that. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was a cool. crazy scene. Um, so let's go post-soccer life. Like, we've kind of, you know, we've had some athletes on our podcast before. Yeah. And we got behind the smoke screens of what it was like after like you knew it was kind of over for you in that athletic career. Mm. Like what did, what did that moment feel like? How did you know? Mm. And was it difficult to walk away from that? Man, I struggled with mental illness for two years, man. Mm. And <clears throat> my podcast that I, that I was really passionate about for a long time was called creating space. And it was all about like identity shift because I struggled very, very badly. I was suicidal for a, about a year and a half of my life. Um, I was in and out of, of uh, help. Uh, and I talk about that very openly. It was right. very dark for me. Mm -hmm. um, I've been through lots of work in that and I've, I've come to the other side where like I can share. Uh, but a lot of people cannot talk about that. Whether you're a soldier <clears throat> or an athlete, um, when that uh, when that identity unfolds 
and you are in love with who that individual is and they can no longer exist at the capacity that you're that you're used to it's very hard it's, yeah. it's very similar to relationships when they unfold um you know you have to you have to pick up the pieces and when you don't know how to pick up the pieces that mm-hmm. then you feel helpless and as a man feeling helpless is one of the most uh um one of the most challenging feelings to feel. And Mm -hmm. so I felt that for two years and it lasted probably longer than it should, but I didn't know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So um, what was really interesting was that when I was soul searching and trying to figure out who I was and what I was without the game, I resorted back to little things that I was doing unconsciously, which was in college I worked at Abercrombie and Fitch because in high school, my uncle was big on eBay and he had a huge store on eBay. I'm talking 415,000 review size page on eBay in the early 2000s. And he knew that one of the biggest margins in the merchandise space was Abercrombie and Fitch. You could buy it for low and you could sell it for high. And I worked in college at Abercrombie and Fish because I could get it at a discount and I could buy as much as they would allow me to purchase every week. I could put it on eBay and I could sell it every week. And that went into, I forced my friends who bought kegs to give me the cups and I would sell the cups at the keg parties. I was the guy like passing out, collecting the money and running running the business of it. And I quickly realized when football was gone, soccer was gone, that I had this desire to not have a boss and to control my, my outcome. And that was where sort of this seed of entrepreneurship, I didn't know the name of it at the time, it wasn't sexy to be an entrepreneur, right? Like nobody taught you how to do it. Like they do teach you how to be a soccer player or mm-hmm. any other sport. So that was the beginning of like my entrepreneurial journey as I evolved, like began to evolve out of just being an athlete. So you were creating your identity into an entre- entrepreneur at that time and that's what yeah. really gave you this like strength to hang on. And- well, those were the, those were the things that, you know, we, we, energy is important for us to understand, right? Like what grows is what you focus on, period. Mm-hmm. And the fuel behind that focus has to be passion or else it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it is not uh, long lasting, right? So um, when I started to hear the conversations of entrepreneurship, I, there was nothing else that existed mm. when those conversations were happening. And as I became more aware as to what my focus was consistently shifting on, then I just knew I had to figure out of all the 999 conversations of entrepreneurship, which were the ones that I knew I didn't like, right? right? Like, which, that sounds hard. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I used to hear people talk about car sales and like yeah. buying and sourcing cars. And I'm like, that sounds awful. I don't mm-hmm. want that. So slowly, you know, when I say this to people that are really tr- tr- coming out of sport or the military who know about my, my past struggle with mental illness, it's not about knowing what you love. It's about knowing what you don't like. Right. Like you got to shut all the doors that are available because when all of the options are available, wherever you are in your life, if you're unhappy and you're like, what's next, what's next? If you can shift the focus from what's next to not to what's not next, it will easily help you find the door that you should walk through or at least the five doors that you should then mm-hmm. shift your focus to. So from that standpoint, it just looked like a bunch of opportunities. And then the next thing that I wanted to focus on was this one dude named Lewis House, who had a very similar story to me, Um, got injured in athletics, decided he wanted to grow a podcast and built an audience online and started sharing courses and online material with how to to grow that. Mm -hmm. And so in 2015, at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, I went on YouTube, figured out how to start a podcast. And that was the beginning of like my true entrepreneurial journey outside of athletics. Nice. That and then that good. led you to management 
of Charlie. So, so I built a podcast and I built an audience. Mm-hmm. Then I started selling like online courses mm-hmm. and quickly realized that's not where I want to go. What I actually want to do is I want to speak. The reason I built the podcast in the first place is because I want to talk about elite performance and mindset and uh, what, it, what it feels like to be a failure and how to really understand what failure means in the long in the grand scheme of success but those podcasts that you were selling had it like how to's that's one stream of income though right correct so i was i was my podcasts were all about mm-hmm. rags to riches stories yeah and then my courses were all about how to grow a podcast mm-hmm. how to how to use and those can kind of work for media. themselves you don't you can create them they can and if you know like what a, you're doing it, yeah. they can be evergreen if you know what you're doing mm-hmm. Man, didn't know what I didn't know, didn't know what, what I was doing because you can set those you can actually set those up and they once you've created it you just let it make money it, it yeah. literally just you create like a certain amount of videos or whatever and people pay for that yep. and then they get and then you just get paid and you don't have to create more it sounds that. so easy but it is so not yeah. it takes such time for you to grow an audience of people yeah. that trust you right. and that care about you and feel that you're a subject matter expert and then at the same time you have to consent consistently sell mm. and 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 push Market, people towards yeah. that and it can become exhausting mm-hmm. so i decided what if i'm not the person selling it and what if i go help somebody with what i've learned who wants to sell it mm. and so last year uh, i uh was had this guy named charlie javely on my podcast uh he's a former manager of two chains and uh little band uh that that you might know as well um and we we had a podcast we were it was an interesting discussion about two chains and travis porter the the group that he that he was repping and uh he mentioned in the in the podcast that he wanted to speak that he had never spoken in his career and he wanted to be paid to be a speaker hmm. and after the conversation we turned down IG Live and I just said, hey man, like if you really want to learn how to build your speaking career, like I can, I can help you. Mm. Um, man, turns out he's one of the better storytellers I've ever seen in my life. Wow. Uh, guy went from multi-million dollar Grammy award winning hip hop manager, mm-hmm. weighing 305 pounds, being diagnosed with a brain tumor and, uh, and his real story is how he shifted his life from leaving two chains and Travis Porter and leaving the music industry, becoming a vegan, moving to California, completely shifting his life, losing 120 pounds and <clears throat> becoming a Nike athlete, being on the Colin Kaepernick commercial that in 2018, it was like the biggest Nike commercial wow. ever. Yeah. Um, just this complete story of transformation that was like that is still really inspiring. And so last year we, uh, we set out on a journey to, to figure out if in a year, if we could take him to a million dollars public speaker, cause that's like the next chapter in his book that would be sexy after mm-hmm. all the things that he has done yeah. to, you know, to pivot and to, to get to that place where he was able to become a, a second seven figure earner in public speaking. And by nine months we were at, uh, 900,000 and uh, we there was a conflict of interest in direction he wanted to go one way out I I, I felt like I needed to go the other Mm. and that shifted my direction into what's now real estate uh, which is is an entirely other story yeah Um, but it's been a complete evolution as an entrepreneur starting to learn the models of business and what exists at, 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 in the in the marketplace that you can make money on mm-hmm. as a business owner, and finding sort of my groove uh, as I develop and as I as I grow and as I evolve. Did you guys have a messy breakup? Man, it was it wasn't messy. It was more just uh, a matter of fact. Mm. It was like, hey, man, you've done real well, and you know, I'm making ten percent management commission. Mm. Uh, I don't believe that the way that you want to go in 2020 is the way that I wanted to go. Right. He wanted to create 
which he has created, and kudos to him because it's been very successful, largely successful. He was looking at all of the other speakers in the personal development realm that are in social media, the Andy Frisellas, the Ed Milets, the Lewis Howes, and we were friends with all of those individuals. We were sharing the same stages as them, but he didn't want to go uh, to create these online Facebook communities, these private communities that were monetized. He wanted to create something that was completely uh, offline, and he called it a digital speakeasy. And he wanted to pull all of his fans into this space that was all based on a text platform um, to where he could communicate to them directly, but they couldn't specifically communicate back to him. So in these texting worlds, you can broadcast out to your community, but they can't very easily broadcast back. Gary Vee hmm. does that. <clears throat> yeah. And he wanted to create that. And for me, if you... I know, because I like, signed up for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, he was one of the At first point, on the wave. Yeah. And I think, I think it's incredible because it saves him from burnout of having people have access to him. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if, if you're on a, if you're on a, on a mission to help change lives, you got to be accessible to a degree. Right. So um, that's a product that becomes harder to sell for a manager that, that and, and I knew that I saw that pathway. Um, and so since then, he's, he's gone in a separate direction that that, you know, offline digital speakeasy is called Quantopia and it's big and they're doing well. And uh, man, I'm into an entirely different world inspired by your very first guest on this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm in his world now, Max Maxwell, and yeah. I can't imagine doing anything else. Right. Yeah. And it looks like you're killing it, by the way. Man, we aren't doing anything compared to what Max is doing. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, he's been in it a while, so. But all you got to do is compare yourself to the greats. And when we look at Max, we're looking way up. <laughs> right. He's so impressive mm -hmm. <clears throat> because he's doing a lot of deals. And his real estate is a fifth of his income. Mm -hmm. So when you recognize that the scale of all of the things that he's doing as a business owner, mm -hmm. you know that if he's doing that many deals right. a month, and it's only equating to 20% of what he actually brings home, he is, a, he is an animal. Yeah. A bigger degree than we even realize. Where's the other money coming from? Is Personal it all, brand. Is it yeah, it's speaking online engagements, marketing. online yeah. marketing, mm -hmm. YouTube. It's coming in various. Uh, because he did talk about that when he was on. He said, like, he paid Gary Vee to come into an event. Did he, did he, he tell you what he paid him? Yeah. 150 Yeah. Direct deposit. Us. Yeah. No down payment, direct deposit. Yeah. He's not working for his kids. He's working for his grandkids. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. And everyone else's kids. And you never know it when you get around Max. Yeah, also, Max, super nice guy, down to earth, would never know. Would Unbelievable never know. character, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, his, and the people that work for him as well. Like, super nice That's guy. That's what he attracts. You attract also, what you are. Here's, here's the other thing, generous. Mm -hmm. yep. There's like a generosity there that... That's why he will be successful. Right. Forever. And right. that's why he should be. Like Correct. more generous I think more generous people should be successful. Like it, it would be nice it's nice to see people like him succeed. He made a post the other day that I thought was really tasteful. Um, because Max, since he started his career, has made it a point to share everything that he learns. If he if he yeah. if he uh, engages in it and he learns it to be effective for him, he immediately teaches it and he uses, you know, YouTube specifically to broadcast it. <clears throat> and he's taught the blueprint. Like, I am I am a disciple. They talk about Jesus disciples, <laughs> right? Like, I'm a Max Maxwell disciple. I have watched, I would say I have a master's degree in Max Maxwell. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, that's for real. I have, how many, how many hours do you study in classes to get a master's degree? If, 500 hours is the precipice that says I have a master's degree or I don't. I got a master's degree in Rex. Right. I've spent that much time listening to him. And he made a post the other day that was so tasteful because uh, he, it said, it read, if I've, uh, I've given you the blueprint, so how could I ever be upset or something like that? Which basically means like, 
I want you to succeed. That's the reason that I did everything that I did. Right. Don't for one second think that I'm ever upset that you're now having success because I took the time to like lay out the blueprint. And I thought that was tasteful because I feel as though some people really want to showcase what they're doing, but they really don't want people that learn from them to get closer to them and have at some point maybe close success or equal success or greater success as them. Whereas the moment you get around guys like Max, you know he wants you to win just as much mm-hmm. as he wants himself to win. Yeah. yeah. And that's a beautiful thing about successful, like really successful people when they're in this place where they're not worried about competition. Right. Where it's more of a community feel. And I think starting that even early in a business is it is is the right path to take. Yep. So to be able to say, look, like you're you're able to provide something that that I am providing in a different space, Correct. or I'm providing in a different way. Like for me, it's an art form. So what my eyes see are going to be different than what all the other photographers in in Greensboro and the surrounding area what they see when they produce a photo. Yeah. So there's there's this like appreciation of the art form itself and there's a community in that if you allow it and you want that Mm -hmm. then then to say oh well i'm trying to compete with you for your clients i don't ever feel that way i'm like if you like my work you should come to me if you don't like my style and my work you should go to her or him or whoever well and probably i'm sure you probably feel the same way with like it's like the it's like we don't hard sell memberships if you like this place mm-hmm. and you value it, then it's true value in it and you just become a member. Mm-hmm. Did you, you know? have to work on that as a as an, an entrepreneur who's also an athlete who there's this tr- true competitive nature inside you? Like, are there moments where you have to catch yourself? <clears throat> there were when I was wanted- selling cigars. Right. Where I really wanted to push specific cigars, but then I took a step back and I was like, you know what? Mm-hmm. like. It's not about what I want them to have. It's about their experience. Yeah. And so I had to teach myself to create that experience in the humidor, in the retail store where yeah. I, I presented that and got to know them as a genuine person in that space, in that two minutes when we're walking around in that circle. But like back here, no, I never had to do that. Yeah. Because it's a natural thing. If you make it unnatural, then you're a sellout. Yep. And then you're selling out yourself. You're selling out your soul. Then you're losing your core members because it becomes this scene that it's not meant to be. Right. I mean, look at like where we are. We have this fireplace. We have this amazing filtration system where it's just like, this is the place to come and relax. Mm. And if you sell out and you're pushing and you're on billboards, and you're shouting out to everyone in Greensboro that this is the place to be, then it's not actually the place to be. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, th- I feel that equates to a lot of life, man. The mm-hmm. more you try to grasp and cling on to things, the less they become what they actually are supposed to be. And I mm-hmm. feel... Oh, that's good. I feel the open mindset that's is the really mindset good. that really likes... That it is the essence of, of evolution, man. <clears throat> so... It'll be interesting to see where this podcast goes, uh, you know, for a little while. I'll, I'll ask this, man. I've, I've managed a, a podcast or two in my day. What are some of the best questions that elicit the best responses from your guests? Like, what do you like to hear? Do you like to hear great stories that are sort of X-rated? Do you enjoy hearing? What are some of the what are some of the questions that you guys ask? This is going to be are, a different response, but- between me and Phil, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Let's hear it. Um, I would say that the kind of responses that that I like or the kind of dialogue that I appreciate is more on the level of like advice or mm. um, like lessons learned, mm. things that have impacted you like or are you or any other guests, like something that's impacted them in some significant way in their career or, or post-career. Or so let me answer that question. Yeah. 
If there's one piece of advice, if you've made it this deep into the podcast and you really give a shit about what I'm about to say, <laughs> I am appreciative that you made it to this podcast. The first thing I'd ask you to do is send me a DM on Instagram. My Instagram is Wesley T. Knight. <laughs> and let me know you made it this far. All right. Let me know you made it this far. Yeah. Okay. Wesley Here's T. my Knight. advice. Your heart knows more than your head. Every single decision I've tried to make with my head in my life, I have failed. When I have felt it from my center core, when it has been um, something that I think about even when I'm not thinking, when I have gotten quiet, gone for a walk, taken the phone and left it on the counter, put the headphones away, and I have gotten into nature and I have slowed down, it has been obvious. So I don't care what the decision is, in my opinion, the advice stays the same from when I wanted to go and, and choose a, a, a team that I p played for in my soccer career to if I really wanted to walk away from business ventures or business partners and move on to the next thing. If you are at a point where you want guidance, it's already inside you, like it's there. Your goal is to find it. And I love the Lion King for that exact uh, uh, identification. Simba uh, is, is fled from Pride Rock because Scar comes in and kills his father Mufasa. So he goes on a journey. And the journey is all about running away from this like idea. The idea he doesn't even understand, but it's an idea. And he takes off and he goes on his merrily way through the jungle and he finds Timon and Pumbaa. And they're these two individuals that say, uh, do you know Hakuna the Matata. Hakuna Matata? And it means, it means no worries. There you go. <laughs> right? All the rest of your day. So they see this young. It's a problem free. Come on, yeah. Phil. All right. Yeah. She's got it. Philosophy. You got it. And so the idea of that entire no. venture as they, as they, pull the, the, the movie across is he then meets this baboon. The baboon is called Rafiki. Rafiki. Hey, he knows. And Rafiki is all about mindfulness. And if you understand mindfulness, it's all about understanding self and taking time to like get quiet. And Rafiki points uh, Simba to the water. And he looks in the water and he sees a reflection of himself, but what he sees in his own mind is his father. Mm -hmm. And then he looks up to the clouds and his father basically tells him to go back and take over what is his, which is Pride Rock. Mm -hmm. None of that happened in Simba's real life, right? Like that wasn't in his physical reality. Right. That happened in his mind and in his heart, right? So I correlate that I use that story often because I feel that we all need that moment where we look into the reflection. And the only way to really get that is when you go in nature and get outside and slow down. Mm -hmm. So the advice, I don't have any grandiose advice about how to build a million dollar business. I've not done that. I don't even really know how to tell you to become an MLS soccer player because I wasn't there very long. What I do know is that the answers are inside and I feel that the most intelligent people that I've ever had conversations with, the correlation between all of them had been, get quiet, the answers inside are inside, trust yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's somebody on this podcast who's made it this far, who's already got to my Instagram and shot me a DM that they made it this far. <laughs> I'm talking to you. That's my advice on that subject. None of my none of my other advice matters, but that's the one that I doubled down on. So I hope that helps. Mm. That's good. What about you? Oh, what's my favorite part of the podcast? What is the, what is the question? That yeah, you I like, like the answer? ones where we catch people off guard. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hit me with something. He wants to know about that's partying. juicy. He wants to like hear he he wants to hear about the parties. Let's think about this. I didn't even prepare for this, but let's go with. What was the strangest moment 
when you were playing professional sports, when yeah. you were out partying, like what was the weirdest thing that had happened to you? Ooh. All right, I got two stories. Okay. One is when I partied with David Beckham. Mm-hmm. He's a he's an idol of mine, so it's only natural that I would, you know, get fanboyish for this opportunity. However, <clears throat> we're in LA. We tied LA in LA. Nice. It's a big result. Yeah. Lads are going out. Mm-hmm. I'm talking there's drinks in the, there's crushing beers in the locker room. Like, All right. So it was Beckham. But didn't they also have another star on the team when Beckham was there in L.A.? Uh, They're all stars, Phil. No one to the degree. They had Landon Donovan. He was like the right. American kind mm-hmm. of star. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. until Beckham an American left hero. Zlatan Ibrahimovic came and he... Right. He's not Beckham status, but he's up there. There's only one Zlatan. There's only one Zlatan. <laughs> I came, I saw a Zlatan. Yeah. Oh uh, <laughs> yeah. Great book, by the way. You should read his book. It, it is his autobiography. Is that the name of it? Because that's amazing. I think it's called. I think it's just called Zlatan. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. He, the guy that wrote that book, was incredible. Anyways. Who wrote it? I don't remember. So he didn't write it? Well, uh, not many athletes <laughs> write their own books. <laughs> his book that somebody else wrote. Yeah. All right, let's his, hear about his this. His depiction of his life. Let's hear yeah. about this book. Written by someone else. Uh, all right. Big, big on the road result, 2-2. Mm-hmm. I fouled David Beckham, got a yellow card. Nice. He didn't want to help me up off the ground because I slid tackled him. Mm. He knew I was there, though. That was big for me. We're smashing beers in the, in, in the locker room. Guys are lit. We're all drunk before we get to the bus to get back to the hotel. Get to the hotel. <clears throat> uh, we had this guy on our team that was a Frenchman, Eric Hasley. Eric Hasley was the guy on the team that would fly to Vegas the night after a soccer game just to party in Vegas and fly back to Vancouver. But he knew Bex, like, to a degree. They played uh, against each other many times. He played for France. Beckham played for England. Uh, Eric Hasley. He's in touch with Bex, convinces Bex that, to come out. We're in L.A. Can't even remember the name of the joint. Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. We're in the, the roped-off spot, and it's all MLS players. So there's not really that many people around, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to get in. There's not really that many chicks, like, trying Mm -hmm. to be a part of what we're doing. And that's okay because we got a couple bottles and, Mm -hmm. you know, the rich guys on our teams paid for it. We didn't have to pay. We were the young kids. Mm -hmm. So we're having a a smash time just getting by. Club closes at 2. It's 11.34. I'll never forget it because I looked on my phone, pulled it out, Checked it out. The first iPhone back in those days. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, the back door. You still have the- that iPhone. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Next thing I do. The same phone? The yeah. same iPhone. iPhone 1 right here. It's 11.34 right now. With actually. 76 cracks on it. Um, door opens up. Four or five humongous, what looked like offensive linemen in the NFL walk in. All black shirts all with the the little mm-hmm. remote thing on their ear because they're communicating with each other. Secret service. Dude, it was like all of a sudden a holy figure started walking through. <laughs> yeah. This individual comes walking so in. You can't see him quite yet because he's dressed in all black. Bex always wears black. Mm-hmm. Thing you know about Bex. Walks in. He's like strutting. It's just him and one of his boys on the team and his manager. They come walking in, and it wasn't 15 seconds until every individual and all he, and all women in the club knew who it was. And at that point, when I talk about bending reality, that was the point that you see people turn into individuals that they've probably never been again in their lives. I mean, mm-hmm. girls were reaching over the VIP. Uh, right. That people were throwing money at Beckham to try to get them to take a him to take a picture. Wow. Like it just became this frenzy that was bu- that just bizarre. Yeah. Um, things you you never notice in your life. So we had to leave that club, 
all get piled up into his two Denali's, taken to a hotel, and in order for you to enter the hotel, you had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, NDA. Wow. And it just, it, there was that level mm-hmm. of just wildness that I didn't even know existed, yeah. right? So he can't tell us the rest of the story. Can't tell you what, what happens next because really? he signed the NDA. Wow. <clears throat> and if that ever came back, because you guys are going to blow up in your podcast. Yeah, right. And if that <laughs> ever came back. Um, other more like outlandish are like bar fights. Mm-hmm. You know, I had this, I had this guy, my second year in Vancouver, his name was Johnny Steele. He was from Northern Ireland mm-hmm. and he, he was Conor McGregor without all of the fighting history. Right. Like he just did not take an ounce of shit mm-hmm. and was the first person to, to throw a punch. And it didn't matter how big the guy was. So I saw that guy get in so many bar fights. Mm-hmm. Um, Have you been to Ireland? Never. Never. I've been to Ireland. I no. love it there. That's a cool place. I heard it's beautiful. It's so beautiful and just fun. I, yeah. A lot of fun. It looks unbelievably beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's where I they film a back. lot of movies. I'd like to go back there and take Isn't that where Game of Thrones is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, no cooler stories than that in the bar scene. Yeah. Oh, who? Tell us. It. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah. So, so polite of you, Phil. I was going to ask you who, because we've talked a little bit about like different celebrities and stuff like that. Who, besides Beckham, who have you met that is like, have met? you met anyone else that you just like were starstruck over or? Mm, yeah, Steve Nash. Uh, that that was the other, the only other athlete that I got real starstruck over was Steve Nash. Um, uh, when I met Steve Harvey, I was pretty beside myself with you Steve. Steve Harvey? <coughs> I did was meet Steve. He's a really nice guy. He seems like a nice yeah, guy. Yeah, everything you see on TV is who he he's is. Like who he he's is, locked yeah. into that character, mm-hmm. whether or not that's truly him <laughs> yeah. or not. He's locked <laughs> he's in. Like, like he like, yeah. he's got so many reps on that that he's mastered that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that's an individual that I met that like you can feel that they live in their heart that 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 they I feel he does uh most of what he does comes from a place of like sincerity. Mm-hmm. Um he he is he's next level. And then uh man um I met this dude, you guys may know him, you may not. He's not really that big of a superstar, but but I really am impressed with like who he has evolved to become and I got to meet him after his artistic career, but his name is Mike Posner. Mm-hmm. Um, my, Mike Posner uh, is the guy, I took a pill in the bees. Right, mm-hmm. yeah. Show of each, yeah, it was cool. Mm-hmm. That, was, uh, that, that song was the first song to hit a billion streams on, on Spotify. And... Uh, he went wow, through this existential that. angst, very similar to, to the journey that I went, went on after sport of like, if not this, then what? Mm. Um, and he did much deeper work than I was willing to do. He went to uh, like isolation camps and spent a lot of time in meditation and in silence and traveled to, God, that sounds so peaceful. Yeah. I want an isolation camp. <laughs> yeah, he, he did a lot of that like stuff that weeks. I was unwilling to do. Give me two weeks. I'll come out a whole different human being. Last year, that dude walked across America. Wow. By himself. That's and, crazy. Uh, That's amazing. That's beautiful. To be able to do that, to be able to spend that much time with yourself and uh, complete that feat, I'm inspired by that guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the transition of like celebrity to everyone else above me instead of everyone else below me the way he has flipped his mindset Mm -hmm. and become servant as a leader is next level so he's not an impressive celebrity that i've been around but he's someone that has a presence Mm -hmm. that you'll never forget Mm -hmm. and i believe that is uh that's just as powerful so you're you've been talking some about presence and energy and stuff like that i want to know what do you think that is because i have heard that before you're not the first like there's pe- people just identify this energy yeah. and this presence with certain people. And I know how I would define it. I, I always called it like the soul shine. Mm-hmm. But I think it 
when I hear other people talk about it, it's something more magnetic and powerful than even that, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, how, what do, you, what do you think that is? Uh, it's like powerful. It, like, I don't understand. Yeah, I don't understand metaphysics, but the way that I translate it to myself and the way I visualize it, because I, I live my life through the understanding of energy and, uh, you know, good energy, negative energy. Um, I, I interpret it as this. So are you an empath? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. To my detriment at times. Yeah. I feel you on that. <laughs> so here's, here's the way I see it. You get in a car <laughs> the same way. and you turn the radio on. There's a frequency of waves that are hitting that radio station and that radio station, let's call it 98, nine is pulling in hip hop. And that's a specific frequency that the radio station is pulling the specific sound in. <clears throat> and either the people inside the vehicle are going to be excited about the frequency that is happening or they're not, and they're going to exit. And I feel like, uh, your energy as a human is very similar. You're either going to exude something that people are going to resonate with and they're going to be excited of it or they're not. How you define how that energy is interpreted, I don't know mm. how it's interpreted, but I believe we all like, mm-hmm. let's call it vibrate or emanate mm-hmm. at a specific frequency. And we're going to attract more of what we are than what we are not. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't really know how to describe it other than that. I like to listen to them. I like to be with the people that have a same sound as me. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I was telling you guys about the the lake area in Charlotte. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's a specific sound, so to speak, in air quotes, of people that are up there who tend to have a similar thought on life, approach to life. Uh, I believe in energy, and I believe that, like, your frequency at times hopefully matches your approach mm-hmm. to life and, like, how you how you go about your life and what's important to you. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a little deeper for another conversation. Dude, this is the kind of stuff I like. Phil, yeah. Phil's going to be, <laughs> he's going to switch it up. I'm with that. I'm with that. <laughs> it's just how you interpret hmm? everyone's energy. You should watch the Midnight Gospel. That sounds the, cool. The Midnight Gospel? Yeah. It's like a cartoon, but it's a podcast. But it depicts uh, energy. I've heard of that. Yeah. It talks very much as, as we were speaking tonight. Yeah. I felt it. I think, um, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, one, one of the things that you mentioned was you went through that darkness. Yep. And you seek that light. Yep. And it takes somebody that's been in that spot in that position to be able to like wake up. Yeah. Because once you know there's nothing around the like, dark, yep. mm-hmm. that's when you're like, you're going to only be attracted to, to light. Mm-hmm. And the first time you ever you you are able ever to disseminate between what is light and what is dark, like mm-hmm. otherwise you're not able to mm-hmm. differentiate between until you're able till you hit a rock bottom space or a place where you consistently know that you are low, that you can then identify high and start to figure out how to create more moments of high to where you then create habit and right? that's a and lot habit about is what pulls you to the that space and that's a lot about being an entrepreneur sure because that's how you network that's how you find the people you need to connect it's all with. about identity man yeah. at the end of the day that's why tony robbins has changed so many people's lives because he's got the focus he's helped them refocus what their story is internally we all are driven behind this idea of who we are and what we're meant to do in the moment that you know that, that, or that you recognize that you control your story and that you can change your story at any moment and that the power behind your story is passion, that if you passionately believe that you can be or that you already are, that's, that's all you need to know to wake up and to become something different every day. Yeah, mm-hmm. His message is so, his message is <clears throat> that's so That's why he's powerful. been so powerful to change. Yeah. 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 Right? But at the same time. he's an expert in... He also knows how the mind works, and he's an expert in that. So he, yeah, it, he knows how to manage that. He has conviction when he speaks. He mm-hmm. does. I've seen him. He sees it with have belief. Have you seen him? He says it with belief. Have you met him? I have. Never. No, never met him. No. 
I've been to Unleash the Power like within. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. have you? I have, yeah. Wait, that's like the big... I like, didn't walk the, the hot coals, but yeah, I went to... That's like the Hawaii UPW. thing, right? No. Yeah. He's got those sporadically all over the U.S. Like the camps or whatever. I want to go so bad. They're like $8,000 or something <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. He, it's, it's, I would he's, love to he's go. He's next level. Actually. He's so good. And so, he does podcasts, too, which are... And, like, they're with those camps or whatever conventions or whatever he does podcasts from those are really good so let's tie it back to your real estate yeah let's hear about that i mean you know i'm in the brief time that we've been hanging out and become friends i've really been into what you're putting out there as far as your content goes and Mm. and what's going on in your real estate world as far as that's interesting man because i'm afraid to put content out in that world why? I feel inferior. I feel inferior. I, I, I was wrestling with that today as I was driving mm-hmm. out here. I'm like, I believe in journey marketing and I get so inspired by people who put out content even when they are just in the beginning because it's so nice to see. It's so refreshing to see someone at the start. Yeah. But even to this day, I would describe myself as a vulnerable man. It still feels uncomfortable to feel vulnerable, you know? And I feel vulnerable in real estate uh, because I know how much I don't know. Mm -hmm. And it feels fraudulent at times putting out what I do know Mm -hmm. because I'm aware of what I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I also was looking at it today as I was talking myself out of that bullshit story I was doing (laughs) uh, that I wasn't good enough and I wasn't worthy of what I've done so far. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, I wholesale houses, which means... I find people who are ready to sell their house. I put it under contract and then I go find someone who can actually buy the house and I sell the house at a, at an increased price from what I got it under contract. So I essentially sell the contract. I don't actually sell the house. Mm-hmm. So for instance, Phil, you got a house, you're ready to sell it for a hundred dollars, a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred dollars, Yeah, but it's a hundred thousand dollars. And I know that house is worth $120,000 in the market. That people will pay for. I put it under contract for you for a hundred, and then I go find the buyer that'll pay one twenty, and I have a there's a gap in mm-hmm. between source right. and you make the flip. So that's wholesaling. Mm-hmm. We're on our second fix and flip right now yeah. that we just in high point that we just put out to the market. Mm-hmm. And man, I'm just so overwhelmed with how much there is to learn and how how much I don't know mm-hmm. but at the same time how far we've come in just 150 days of having this business mm-hmm. which you've seen what have you liked about what you've seen well I mean it's first of all it's your energy you have great energy on there wow um, the vulnerability is very relatable to the common person right you know um, I mean that's how we feel yeah we we are really uncomfortable doing this but we just want to do it because we know that it's like meant to happen. Yes. And I feel like that's super relatable to you. So I see the similarities and, you know, I mean, it's just cool to see what you're doing and see how you're growing through the process. Mm. And also like I'm learning shit, you know, like. So when I teach a little bit of what I learn, you enjoy that because you learn as well. Right. Because I've bought uh two houses in my life already wow and and so like i already know like a little bit about it but like just hearing you use that terminology and and seeing your process it kind of makes me think and and now i'm a little bit interested in like flipping houses or something like that the limitations are gone yeah if i can do it bro you can do it so you're inspiring yeah yeah i have a question about that sure so super basic when you are when you talk about wholesaling yeah are you cash buying these places and then and then working with a buyer who then comes in is that how you're able to do that like you have a lot of cash up front and you're able to great do that question or? no money let me tell you how i got my first deal and this is because of max maxwell so if you haven't listened to the max maxwell episode yeah. yet on behind the smoke screen Go back and listen to Max. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Shout out. Uh, 
I was putting out what's called bandit signs. You've seen them. You might not know what they are. They're the we buy houses for cash signs yep. that you see everywhere. That's a bandit those, sign. Yep. They're called bandit signs because they're Ill illegal. Okay. Uh, I was putting out bandit okay. signs all over Huntersville, Denver, and uh, Stanley, North Carolina. Denver. Hustling, bro. <laughs> Sticking those things at every stoplight. Psh, 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 psh. Hopping out. I was going at 9 p.m. when no one else was on the road. 10 p.m. Boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. Putting them everywhere. No one was calling me back. Pissed. These signs cost two dollars a sign. I'm buying a hundred at a time. They take four weeks to get here. I gotta write my number on every single one of the 200 signs. This takes work. I'm mad. So I feel like I'm. I'm there's an issue because these are two dollars every time I put them out in their litter. They get picked up. I put them out on Friday, they get picked up on Sunday. Littering, I'm giving $2 away. Mm -hmm. Well, two weeks into me doing it consistently, I get a call from a guy way out in Wilson, North Carolina. I don't know if you know where Wilson is, but it's in between Raleigh and Greenville, North Carolina. It's in the middle of nowhere. Right. It was like underwater in a prehistoric time. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's what Wilson is. Right. If you're from Wilson, I apologize. Um, so here I am. Send us an email. A happy Tell us how, cool. how great Wilson is. <laughs> here I am. I'm gung ho and ready to go. My dad's my his favorite quote: "Gung ho and ready to go." Mm. I take my happy ass and I drive all the way to Wilson to go look at this guy's two homes that he just got on probate. So probate is when you inherit them mm. from, you know, a, a family member that has mm. passed away. You're you're a part of their inheritance, right? So I'm driving out to Wilson, and while I'm on the drive, I get a call from a guy in Raleigh who is in Charlotte, sees my bandit sign, and says he's got a house in Raleigh he wants to, to, to sell. Wow. Now, I'm a believer in energy. I'm a believer of uh, the word called momentum. I believe that once you prescribe to the universe that you're going in this direction mm -hmm. and that you're, you've made the decision to continue in that direction, mm -hmm. that first it will, it will give you challenges, but if you persist, it will then throw you a nugget. Mm -hmm. It will give you an opportunity to believe. It's like a, a, a mask of oxygen that keeps mm -hmm. you right. going to oh, the next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you look at my shoes, there, there's a Keep specific going. word that's Keep always going. there. Nice. Mm -hmm. So it's like the, the piece that I live by, right? It's there's will always be a silver. There's always a silver line. There's always a moment. Oh, keep going. It. I just have to stop for a second. Yep. Keep going is such a like important thing for entrepreneurs to understand mm -hmm. because so many people fail because they they stop mm -hmm. when they when they have challenges that they don't feel like they can overcome or fa failures that they're just like embarrassed by or they can't get past or whatever it is they stop but the people that succeed are the ones that keep Persist. going that's the only yep. way you succeed is yep. you keep going and, and michael jordan was a, like quoted on that on yep. failure yeah i can't remember the exact quote i'm yep. sure i'm like we could pull it up and read it like any of the great people know it but yeah. yeah it's a common theme right it's a common thing like you have to push you have to keep going. You have to understand that su being successful, you're going to fail over and over and over again to find the success. That's it. And you've got to. That's it. Like, there's no way to find success without it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And people think, oh, I'm just going to like, I'm just going to get there. I'm just going to succeed. I'm just going to have like a great salary. I'm going to have this, that, and the other, and it's going to be easy. Well, no, it's not going to be easy. The people that make it. Anybody that tells you, unless they were handed like a trust fund when they were like mm. children. That's micro content for social right there. <laughs> that needs to be broken down and put mm. into yeah. 15, like, 30 seconds. That is it. That is like, to me, that's the key thing is like, you hit a don't nerve right stop. There. You have to keep going. Have to and it, going. Sounds, it sounds easy, right? When, when, you're, when you've had a bit of success and you look back, but in the moment, there, it's very tempting at times to walk away because you're able to create reasons why you shouldn't keep going. Mm -hmm. and it's easier at times to play it safe than it is to risk. Right? Oh yeah, for sure. <clears throat> we're not taught. We're not taught how to uh, manage risk. We're taught how to mitigate risk. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, <laughs> driving to so Wilson. Good. That's good. 
driving to Wilson. Nothing happened in Wilson. Two shit houses are still. I'll never. I'll never take the videos off my phone of the houses that I took because on my way back I get a call from a guy in Raleigh, and I'm like, oh, what the hell? Can't be worse than the Wilson houses. I stop at this house. This guy, unfortunately, had just lost his father. Mm-hmm. His mother can't step foot back in the house that they raised their kids in. And all of a sudden, this guy and his six other brothers have to get rid of this house. And the house is in terrible condition. I'm talking the floors were decrepit. The roof was caving. There were six, I'm not lying, six vehicles in the front yard, Mm -hmm. in the driveway. He wanted $120,000 for it. House was only worth... After the flippers numbers, the house was only worth about hundred. Mm-hmm. So we do our talking and negotiating down, and I'm like, I, I'd listen to enough Max Maxwell content by now. Right. Look, man, I'm gonna give you one offer, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And, and, if you, and if it's not good for you, I'm gonna walk away. I told him a hundred thousand dollars. Well, Max tells you not to like come off of your maximum allowable. Stay hard on that number. He said, Can you do 105? And I had done my numbers. They calculate, you learn how to calculate the right numbers. So you take the ARV, which is the after rehab value, which is what is this house gonna sell on the market after it's been rehabbed to its best capacity. You multiply that number by 70%, so you get a 30% discount, right? And then you subtract repairs. Mm. So essentially this property, if it in its area, which was highly flipped in Raleigh, there were flips all over this subdivision it was going to go for 190 200 mm-hmm. okay uh 70 percent of that is x minus the repairs which i didn't know how to calculate i was guessing <laughs> i got him to 105 mm-hmm. he said send me the contract i didn't even show up with a contract i had to go home to my docusign and send it over <laughs> got home Sent over the DocuSign. He called me back the next day. said, I can't do 105. I need extra. I need 106. I said, why? He said, because I got to get all my brothers to come over and help me clean out all this you know, this extra stuff. If you want all the extra stuff gone, I got to clean it out. Okay, I'll do 106. Mm-hmm. Got it under contract. Sends it back to me. I don't know how to sell a contract. Now I got a contract. I don't have $106,000. There's not even a quarter of that in my bank account. What am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah. Went to Google. How do I sell a house under contract? Mm-hmm. Pulled up Jerry Norton. Jerry Norton had like six videos of what to do next. Mm-hmm. I go on Zillow, followed the exact playbook he gave me. Went on Zillow, pulled up. Homes that had sold in the last 90 days in that area within half a mile. And I looked for every single house that had been flipped. You could tell by the, by the finishing pictures. I reached out to every one of the agents, the, the, the mm. real estate agents, that represented the seller. And then I reached out to the seller's representative and I told him, I'll pay you $500 if you refer me to the investor that flipped the house that you, uh, that you represented at this, av- at this nice. address. Mm. I came across a lady who's a realtor but also invests. Mm. She said, what do you want for it? Uh, 120? Okay, send me the contract. <laughs> I didn't even have the assigner's contract. <laughs> I had to go to find the real estate attorney mm-hmm. that all the investors talk about in Charlotte and ask him for the assignment. I said, look, I just got a, car, a, a property under contract. I now have a buyer. I don't know what to do next. Right. Tell me what to do. He yeah. said, look, this is what you do. Take this contract, fill it out, send it to me. Let me look over it. I'll send it back to you when it's ready. Send it to her. Wow. I got it under contract at 106. She said she was going to buy at 120. Mm-hmm. We went under contract. In 17 days, I made $14,000. I didn't have any money involved. That's the shit I'm talking about. If, ever since that moment, <laughs> my life has changed. That's the next so three, cool. The next 30 days, I made $62,000 wow. running that play 
over and over and over and over again yeah. like Marshawn Lynch. Wait, but yeah. with the with the We Buy Houses signs? We elevated How once do we you go next. What's so, the next place? Because wow, I'm to this sounds like a real estate I'm podcast. Just to say it, like, so yeah, once we got just money, my career yeah. Bit. So once once we got that money, once we got that fourteen grand, we put that immediately into marketing. So the first step mm-hmm. I went to was uh, SMS marketing. So we text. So I have a uh, virtual because of my time in social media marketing and owning a digital agency and shit. I know about VAs and I know how to manage virtual assistants. So the first thing I did was recognize that I didn't want to be the guy that's sending 1,500 text messages a day minimum. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to hire out that. So I have an incredible virtual assistant in Philippines that has a master's degree. She's smarter than me. Uh, She's a Filipino-American, so she speaks American Mm -hmm. or English with little to no accent. Nice. Um, And I pay her $6 an hour uh, to work. And she... uh, she has a bonus structure that's in place. I pay her $50 for every contract that we get signed, and I pay her a $350 bonus for every contract that's signed that, that closes. Wow. So she's in a bonus structure in her pesos, her Philippine, Filipino pesos, and she makes good money. It's amazing. Uh, and we SMS, and uh, we, we, uh, we focus on people who are motivated to sell, so they're listed in foreclosure or they're uh, in tax delinquency. So people that need to get rid of their house because they're in a v- distressed financial situation. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we, we try to provide help to those people. Mm-hmm. So we use the wholesaling side of the company to seed our business. We take the cash flow from that. We purchase properties that we can fix and flip. Uh, and we now have a machine that's kind of running right nice. now. Um, that's 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 where we are. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Max. Yeah. In this business. And it's crazy, like, you know, as a consumer of the content, I watch Max, we watch Max, and it's truly incredible to see everything that he's doing and his success and, you know, just his influence on people's lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then it's like I go to your page and you're straight up rookie compared to him. But it's <laughs> still... <laughs> so inspiring to see that right you know so you know don't don't go down on but here's the thing i love the place that i'm in Mm -hmm. because i like being the underdog Mm -hmm. but i'm so cognizant of how underdog i am that it negates me still to this day a guy who's been very comfortable in social media and building Mm -hmm. using creating content yada yada whoop de whoop uh still to this day i struggle with Putting myself out, self out there, so everybody has that, no matter what level. I found that when Pete, like, okay, so that's an interesting thing with social media because I find that when people do put themselves out there or are willing to be vulnerable in some way, that there's a greater impact on their audience. Mm -hmm. That people really want want to see that. They want to see somebody that's not afraid to be who they are or to share a piece of themselves. And especially in my field um, where I'm asking vulnerability of my clients. So I'm asking them to be vulnerable in front of me because I'm holding a camera in their face. Mm -hmm. Um, They have to be comfortable with me very quickly. Um, And so there's like the relational aspect of that but there's also this idea of i'm going to be vulnerable so that you can feel more vulnerable with me as well so i share um and and one reason why i'm like on this side of things on the podcast and like on video and on audio even though phil and i have talked about how we're not exactly completely comfortable with that um one reason I think it's important is because vulnerability is a strength in a lot of ways. And in my business, like we, I really, I want people to, to understand that vulnerability is a beautiful thing. Yeah. I think, I think what you were leading, I think what you were alluding to is that you wish more people would be vulnerable and that, that, like that creates strength and connection Mm -hmm. and that allows you to really like understand who people are and what drives Yeah, what we were talking about because your social media page and you being vulnerable, like. Yeah, I think, I know what my block is. Yeah. Um, 
And I think it's the block that a lot of other people have. Uh, I think the real block of it all is that when you open yourself up to people in this space of social media, there is no end to their direct connection to you. And although it is nice to produce the content and put it out, it's almost cathartic in ways for you to go through the process of sharing how you feel or, or like educating in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't also want the responsibility. It's a caveat, right? It's mm -hmm. like yeah. the gift and the curse. You don't always want the responsibility of communicating back to the individuals that come back. Mm -hmm. right. And it becomes this growing responsibility as you, mm -hmm. as you continue along that realm and you build an audience or you have people that are like connected to what you're doing. There becomes a piece of it that becomes exhausting mm -hmm. and it can burn you out. Mm -hmm. And I think once for myself, when I went that way, I built an audience to, not a big audience, but I built an audience to a place where there was an expectation of a response and I got tired responding. Mm -hmm. And I haven't yet felt a way to do it consistently enough to where there's not that need to consistently respond without having to hire somebody to be a community manager if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like there are people at levels that are scared to share because mm -hmm. they just don't want to share. That's like level one. Right. Level two is like, I know I want to share, but I don't know how much I want to share. Level three is like, I'm open. I'm willing to share. And I want all of the people to come and talk and be open. And I'm I want level two. all of it. And then there's the fourth <laughs> level where you somehow figure out how to get to this servant leadership place where you're, all the content you make is for everybody underneath you, but you've placed a team underneath you that blocks you from all of the inbound to where really yeah. your only space is the outbound, mm -hmm. right? So you're able to produce and let go, but there's a system in place that consistently like nurtures yeah. what's beneath you. So I know that I'm not at level one, I'm not at level two, or sorry, I'm not at level three, I'm here at level two mm -hmm. where I know that I don't have anything in place to make me not have to like respond to everyone who wants to ask questions about real estate so, but or wants to learn more. So, but taking that next step though, like what's keeping you from taking that next step? Because you, you could easily Money just solves make, all problems. Right, you could make that. a decision today and say, I'm gonna bring somebody in that can help me filter these things yep. and still be able to, and be able to reach people in a beautiful way. I could do it for sure. Yeah. I could do it. Uh, the cave that you fear to enter is the one that holds your treasure, mm -hmm. right? Like, I think I, and I know that when I'm passionate and I am in that energy that I can help people get excited about real estate in the way that I'm excited about it. Man, I haven't found it consistently yet. Mm -hmm. It'll hit me if it's supposed to hit me. Yeah. It'll hit me. Yeah. But it's I sure do appreciate balance. the people that do have it. Yeah, you know what I mean. When they do mm -hmm. have it, and they're, they're they're out there producing content consistently on a big scale, I mean, that is a that is a huge task. And I think there's this point in business where you're like grind, 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 grind. You're so focused on like the intricacies of the business that you're not thinking about like if I just take this one next two like one step or two steps up, yep. then I'm gonna find this almost like this like place of peace a little bit you're not willing to release that, you're not willing to delegate those tasks out to someone else because you wanna have control. That's part of my, where I'm at, my business. Yep. Like I don't want to give somebody else that task because I value the portion of it that I'm able to provide. So for example, when I make a post on Instagram, this might seem small to, to a lot of people, but if I make a post on Instagram, I like to write. I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. And so I also like to include like things that are coming straight from me about the picture or something that that picture sparks for me. Yeah. So I don't just, like sometimes I'll put quotes and sometimes I'll do those kinds of things, but oftentimes I'll put something that I wrote myself yeah. about my client or something that I wrote that was relative to that photo um, that maybe was personal to me at some point. Um, and to give that job, that task to someone else would be amazing because it would like, it would free up time. Sometimes those posts can take t 
time, like 30 minutes, an hour, or whatever sure. it is that I'm putting into that writing. Yep. Um, <laughs> To That's be able what you to, do for me. Right. This is what I do. <laughs> but I don't, though, in the same way that I would for me because... That's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, because this, my level of emotional attachment to the work that I do for you is different than what it is that I do for myself. No, I was just kidding. Right? Yeah. You see what I'm saying, though? Yeah, yeah. I feel like some of the stuff that I will write for me, your audience is not going to like feel the same way about the same kind of thing. But I, I will do... like quotes that you i feel some, like are yeah you you have some nice quotes. yeah you're yeah. It, it sounds like your your artistic expression is very important to you it is and, and, and you you know you hold that at a very high value for sure and yeah. i and actually almost value that more than expansion mm. um that's cool it says Shayna loves to read quotes i love to read quotes i do, I do. but I i'm a writer I so quotes a lot listen there's like this whole quote thing on the internet. There's like a quote like craze on the internet where you're like supposed to find like the best ways to live and like the most like hope and this, that and the other. But the, the reality of it is for me is just I like words and I'm a writer and you I like appreciate. Words? Shut up, Phil. You know, <laughs> you know me. Um, All right. Let's hear this quote. All right. Because I could keep going she's about gonna, how much I love words. She's going to explain <laughs> All right, here we go. about how she loves the words. This and is then it. All right, this guy. She's going to explain about why she loves this quote. Okay, so this is Tracy. And then I'm not sure if, that's, if I'm saying that right. I gave up painting. I gave up art. I gave up believing. I gave up faith. I had what I called my emotional suicide. I gave up a lot of friendships with people. I just gave up believing in life, really, and it's taken me years to actually start loving and believing again. I realized that there was a greater idea of creativity, greater than anything I could make just with my mind or with my hands. I realized there was something, the essence of creativity, the moment of conception, the whole importance, the whole being of everything. And I realized that if I was going to make art, it couldn't be about, it couldn't, be about a fucking picture it couldn't be about something visual it had to be about where it was really coming from mm. Mm. i think mean, that's pretty powerful it's the heart it's the heart space man mm -hmm. yeah. it goes back to that uh space that you got to find where truth exists what i was trying to tell you guys earlier that like that's the only thing that i feel is true that i've learned about my battle in life is that like there's there's just there's this frequency that your heart emits and every heart emits is, is a separate energy or a separate frequency replace the word with whatever you want to place it with jesus buddha allah whatever the word is for it it's just this space that he that comes from this space in you and there's truth there mm -hmm. and i think you can pull a lot from that but that from is like whatever you interpret it to be mm -hmm. and your in my interpretation of life is like your job as you grow is to interpret what the f fuck is coming from that space for you mm -hmm. and then create that yeah. yeah right like you are the evolution of whatever is resonating from you at that time and it's okay for your heart space to shift and to evolve and to grow and to change and for you also to do that mm -hmm. you know what i mean like yeah man that's the greatest part about you know life is that we have the freedom to become right mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. we don't have to stay as we are so we many become. people don't feel that though they feel like they're caged in right. so many ways and i think for so many entrepreneurs they're willing to take those risks they are willing to step outside of whatever those well she was willing to let go of everything she ever knew yeah mm -hmm. to create something different than what so there was something that she didn't like mm -hmm. that was so painful for her that she had to let go or he or I think yeah. it was he or she Tracy I don't know could uh, be Tra either. yeah it could be either she just had to let go of what uh, is to find something better that could be right mm -hmm. so man it's just about becoming dude like mm -hmm. when I take pressure off of shit like money comes mm -hmm. When I take pressure off my relationship, like, the sex is better. Mm -hmm. When I take pressure off, like, this expectation that I have to be great every single day, life is easier. My anxiety is lower. Grasping and clinging is what humans are really good at because mm -hmm. it feeds our, our you know, fight or flight mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, mm, capacities yeah, in so our true. life, right? Like when you grasp and you cling to an idea or yes. like a person or identity or where you need to be at this time and what right. you need to wear. Yeah. It's like when, when you let go of that and you just, when you just are. Yeah. Everybody likes a person in the, the, yeah. the, 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 the bar, or the club or the gathering or the, the podcast that's just themselves. How do you right? do that? You got it. It's a conscious choice. It's like when you're trying to grab that greasy watermelon, remember? Mm-hmm. It just slips right out. Yeah. It's so true. But if you hold it nice and loose yeah. and you just run as fast as you can, then mm-hmm. you're going to get it over that ledge. <laughs> it's so true, though. Exactly. Man, we've gone all over the place on this <laughs> podcast. We should have started there and just stayed there. Yeah. We could have been airy. Yeah. That's really, but you keep coming back to this, and I don't know if it's just like for sure where I'm at right tonight, like today, but I needed to hear that. So that it was, it's really good. Needed it's to really hear what? Stuff. The hard just, space stuff? Just like this idea of um, like hanging on and, and being like really just like being more just present and allowing. Sure. things to just be because yeah. I'm I'm very much like I find security and comfort in knowing mm-hmm. and I think that's probably most human beings feel that way 100%. but especially in the reality that we all live in today and really just the reality in general we, we all think we have control at times but there's really no control like mm-hmm. we don't have control ever yeah, control is just an idea. It's just a byproduct. It's an illusion. Of, it's an Fear. idea. Really? Yeah. It's just an idea. It all comes back to being afraid. Um, and when you Damn, something- Phil, that was the deepest shit I've ever heard you say, bro. <laughs> that was Wait, big, let it finish. Yeah. Hold a on. Moment. That yeah. was a moment. <laughs> yeah. That was big. Yeah. It's true. Because that's the biggest truth bomb that's been mm-hmm. put on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, dude, that's fear. I don't think yeah. so. Control is fear. Yeah. You're right, man. Yeah. It all comes back yeah, to that. Yeah, it is. And when you're afraid of something, you're going to lose it. Mm-hmm. Bruh. You know? And you think that shit in existence, come on now. and then it, you know, it becomes truth, mm-hmm. you know? So you can't live out of fear. And that's the amazing lesson that you keep bringing us back to on mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. But. This guy's artful, man. Yeah, I think it's time to wrap it up. <laughs> Do we have any last questions? Well done. I wish I had a rapid round for him. We, he needs a rapid round. So how does it feel to have your own Wikipedia page? Oh, man, that's still up? Yeah. I don't even know what it says anymore. What does it say? It gives your back. I, it's just I like know, a bio. I read it. Oh, it's just like a soccer bio? Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, there was a time where that was a it was a standard <laughs> thing for your buddies to like make yeah. jokes on your Wikipedia page. Did, they, did your friends like it. go on there and try to edit? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. It, it said amazing. some it said some it. really hilarious stuff yeah. throughout the years. Mm-hmm. I hope it didn't say anything too embarrassing. If so, direct me to it so I can. It was just normal. Get that changed. Yeah, yeah. It was normal. yeah, I mean, I I think um, the the coolest thing that has ever happened to me is when I got. Uh, my own play, playing card. Nice. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, when Top Deck uh, or Upper Deck sent sent us a card, like every, every, you got your own rookie playing card. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that that was the moment that I thought was really cool. The Wikipedia, the online stuff, wasn't that cool. But I used to collect baseball cards when I was little. Mm. So that that was a. Do you have a cool. stack of those that you like hand out to? Nah, no, no, no. I just got one. <laughs> Actually, I'm telling you right now. If I had a playing card, I'm gonna have a stack of them in my house, and yeah. everybody comes to my yeah. house is getting one. I'm like, yeah. here's my playing card. Shane would stack. make them into coasters, <laughs> and you can use. She'd hand out the coasters. No, hell no. It'd be a party favor <laughs> with a, a bottle of wine. Mm. I'd be like bottle of wine. You hand out bottles of wine at your party, here's, and here's my playing That's what's card. Up. Invite me to the party. <laughs> me too. Hell yeah! If I was status like. If I was that kind of status, I'd be like, here's your wine and my, and my playing card with Man, all my stats. I'll, I'll, I'll say this for you, too. I've watched this podcast evolve. Mm. Um, I put out 287 of my own podcasts. Wow. So that sounds I've, exhausting. I've, I've, yeah, yeah. I've, I've put out a, a, a few, and I understand the work that comes behind it. Mm. So I'm just impressed that you guys have continued to make it this 
would have never this didn't happen until like episode 250 for me shout out so to Quinn it's all him when it comes to the part of where you guys are in the timeline of what it could be mm-hmm. it's great mm-hmm. and you're only going to get better and ask better questions and have better guests yeah so I appreciate you of all the badasses that you've had on here I mean Myron Bell mm-hmm. I mean come on he was the f- safety at the Steelers before uh Palomalu. Palomalu. Come on, man. Yeah. I mean, you've had Max Maxwell who have changed well over. He's That guy has created at least five to ten millionaires mm-hmm. just by himself, which is you talk about power, that's power alone. Yeah. Right? And those are just two individuals that I know specifically that have been on your podcast. So for me to even get an opportunity is an honor. Yeah. So um, – well, we look I hope to you continue building this thing because yeah. if you're at this place now, 12 months from now, who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you'll definitely be on again. Man. Reoccurring Hopefully I'll be in a better spot. Hopefully I won't still yeah. be in the same place. Yeah. And the Wikipedia page will be a little better. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to it and we'll do yeah. some editing on that. Put in that wholesale uh, <laughs> Wikipedia part. Wholesale guy from yeah. Easley. Yeah. No. Uh, last thing. If you made it this far down to the podcast, and if it doesn't get edited out, if we if you've connected on anything that I've said, and you want to chat, I love connecting. Don't take what I said earlier about not really wanting the responsibility to respond. I'm at a place now where if I get a a, a conversation that happens in messages that that is real and and uh, you know necessary, I like to bring it to a phone call. I like to bring it to a text message. I like it to to turn into a real relationship. So, you know, if you've been through something in your life like mental illness and and that resonated with you or you like wholesaling and real estate and that resonates with you or you're a soccer fan and you want to talk footy, hit me. I love all of those things. That's great. I just want to say, I just think it's amazing that you were talking about mental health so openly because so many people will not do that because there's stigma to mental health. 100%. And I think... Being able to like openly discuss that is a really amazing thing, and thank you for doing that. Yep. There will certainly be people that will hear this, and and really need to hear that. So yeah, thank, thank you, you for sharing your experience with it, um, and Man. I hope it will encourage other people to open up to, to people in their lives mm-hmm. to be able to talk about the same thing That's because right. it's really important to know that you're not alone. And there, there are lots of people battling lots of different types of mental illnesses and um, people need to know that there's like hope mm-hmm. and encouragement and support out there. So, and I think we should certainly shout that out like with the podcast. And yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Give some resources there. So. Love it. So thank you so much for hanging out with I'm us. I'm just honored awesome. to be in the hot seat, man. Yeah. Thank you guys no, for having me. that was so me. much fun. This I really enjoyed show. talking to you and hearing from you and learning more about you, too. So. Awesome. That's it. <laughs> from behind the smoke screens. Hey. Love you guys. <laughs> <laughs>